just okay. Uh, before getting to the extra core of my talk, I want to just flesh the um, kind of structure or, or contrast the structure of classical computers and, and quantum computers. So if we just think about what's happening when we write a program for a classical computers, what the compiler does ultimately is just to translate our um, Python code into a sequence of uh, NAND gates. Right? So, so NAND gates, a set of NAND gates is a, is a universal set of gates. So every, every problem that we want to solve, we can now translate into a sequence of these NAND gates, which we apply to a bunch of bits. And ultimately we can read off the, the result. Right? So we could just, this year could be, for example, an exact diagonalization code. And what we read off is the magnetization of the um, Ising model. So, so, so this is how the classical computer operates. For the quantum computer, we, we can draw it in a similar way. So we just again prepare our quantum computer in, in some initial state. But then instead of applying universal NAND gates to it, which are classical, what we do is we just have now a universal set of, 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 of quantum gates, which, which uh, involve, for example, Hadamas or um, C0 gates and spin rotations. And by performing those operations, we can then approximate every unitary operation acting on those n qubits. And ultimately, we just again do a measurement, and this is now the measurement of whatever quantity we, we, are, we are interested in. So and just to stress this again, so the, the big difference between current quantum computers and classical computer is that for classical computers, we can just draw these circuits as deep as we like to, and, and there's no nothing stopping us except that we don't want to wait too long. But for quantum computers, at least with the current noisy quantum computers, we have to be quite careful because if we circuits are getting too deep or containing too many gates, then um, the quantum information is just lost and the outcome or what we measure is, is basically just noise. Good. So, so this is basically now um, setting setting the stage. And what I want to want to do in the following is I want to discuss um, two concrete applications of of quantum computers for studying um, different quantum phases of, of matter. Particularly, I first want to discuss the crossing of a, of a symmetry protected topological um, phase. And in the second part, I want to show how we can realize and characterize topologically ordered states. So let me jump with you right to the, um, to the chase. And what I want to do first is I want to introduce a, um, a model system that exhibits a topological or a symmetry protected topological phase. And this is a quite nice model. So it's a model that lives on a, on a one-dimensional chain made out of simple Ising spins. And we have now three, three terms in the Hamiltonian. So the, the first term is just the nearest neighbor ferromagnetic Ising coupling. Then we have a, a paramagnetic field. And we have a, have a so called, um, cluster state Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian, as I write it down here, has a, has a number of, of different symmetries. So it's a, uh, it's a real Hamiltonian, which means it's invariant under complex conjugation. And also it has, uh, uh, it's, it's invariant under a global spin flip. So it commutes with a string of, of sigma x's. So, so, so this is, these are some important um, facts about this Hamiltonian. And now we can draw the, the phase diagram. And, and this is done here in, in this triangle. And the way that I'm drawing the phase diagram is that at the three corners of this phase diagram, we have the extreme cases. Um, for example, at the right corner, we only have the um, transverse field. At the top corner, we only have the Ising term. And at the left corner, left lower corner, 
we have the cluster state um, Hamiltonian. So at these corners, the ground state is extremely simple. Um, right? So it's just a, a polarized state, it's a ferromagnetic state, and it's a cluster state. And as we now um, tune along the um, um, this triangle, we have now phase transition. Right? So for example, if we just stay on the on, on, on this side of the triangle, of this uh, edge of the triangle, then this is now a transition from the cluster state into the Ising ferromagnet. And here it's the transition from the Ising ferromagnet to the Ising paramagnet. So this is the well known quantum, uh, the, the well known transverse field Ising model on, on this edge. And then here we have a transition from a cluster state to a trivial state. So, so this is a model that I quite like because it's, 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 it's fairly, a fairly simple model, but it does exhibit a fairly rich phase diagram, right? including symmetry broken SPT and also a, a trivial phase. Good. So this was the advertisement for, for this model because it's quite nice and exhibits a rich, rich phase diagram. But there's something else which is really neat about this, this model. And this is the fact that if we go along this black line here, so, so here let's have this black parabola. If I'm sticking on this path, then we can represent the ground state on this path uh, by using a, a fairly simple quantum circuit. So, so this is now uh, a bit special because what we, what we have is that we can just write down the exact ground state wave function along this entire path in the form as shown here. Right? So basically what we have to do is we just um, use a, um, just a two-side gate, which we just apply sequentially to, the, um, to these qubits. And if you're just running this um, fairly simple code, right? so if you just basically code on the quantum computer, this uh, the action of just this one gate that we just keep applying sequentially then once the program finished it produced the the ground state of this model at a, a given parameter which means that we don't have to solve any complicated uh, variational problem so so this is now a state which we can just uh, prepare on a on a quantum computer Clearly, this is an exactly solvable model, so we don't learn anything deeply new about it. But the cool thing about this is that it presents us a, a toy state or a model state which we can produce, and then we can play around with it and do measurements right? in the same way as the AKLT state is easily prepared on a, on a, on a classical computer. Or, uh, for example, we might sample Laughlin wave functions to learn properties about quantum Hall. Let me give a little bit more detail about what I, uh, what I mean by this. So, so the, the main message is that if we, <clears throat> if we just take this model along this parabola, then we can represent the ground state exactly using a circuit. And the circuit is done using the sequential application of these two side gates. And these two side gates, they can be decomposed into elementary uh, operations that we can directly um, code using um, using the IBM or whatever quantum computer. Right? So, so these quantum computers, for example, IBM has a Quiskit um, programming language and, and they have a certain set of universal gates and we can just translate those gates in, in these elementary gates. And there's one additional trick that we that we use, and uh, so you might have asked why is one of those uh, green and not blue? And there's one nice property. So, so, so the let us now assume that we have uh, a system which is infinite, right? So, so we have now a completely uniform and infinitely extended system, and in order to produce or to get the ground state for this infinite system, all we have to do is just to repeatedly apply the blue, these blue gates 
to, to our qubits. And by this, we can now generate the state for an infinite system, but that requires an infinite number of qubits, which is not very practical on, on any uh, um, quantum computer. Now, however, what we want to do ultimately is we want to do some measurements. So let's say that we want to just do a measurement on, on a given qubit, uh, which is just shown here in, in red. And if we want to measure the qubit, this red qubit, what, what we do if we just do this measurement, we just sandwich it, right? So we just take one state which is prepared, we just act on it with some local operator, and then we just mm, uh, take the, the cat. But then we notice if we just look from the bottom up, we see that all those gates cancel, right? Because all those are unitary gates, so each of these gates, um, the, the, the gates contained in the bra, cancel with the gates in the, in the cat. So, so everything from bottom infinity up to here uh, cancels. From top infinity to bottom, uh, to, to, to our side where we measure, this is not the case, um, um, as you can see by the, by the construction. However, what we can do is we can just replace everything that we get from top infinity to the side where we measure, we can just replace it by the dominant eigenvector of the transfer matrix. So it's a, the same trick that we use when, when solving the um, 1D classical Ising model using the transfer matrix um, formalism. And the dominant eigenvector of the transfer matrix, we can also represent in terms of a uh, um, circuit. And this is now exactly the blue, uh, sorry, the, the green, the green unitary, right? So, so the, the key idea that we um, follow here is that we just make use of the fact that this is a uniform circuit. The bottom part, because of it being unitary, uh, cancels for any measurement, for any local measurement. And the top part, we can just encode everything into the into a, a single unitary gate. So, so what it means or the upshot is that along this path, what we can do is we can just represent the state directly in the thermodynamic limit and perform and, and the number of qubits that we need for doing the simulation corresponds only to the number of qubits on which we actually want to do measurements with respect to, to this state. And for people who are familiar with uh, matrix product states, this, this is well known because when we have a matrix product state in the canonical form. Uh, this, one question. Yes. Uh, what is the definition of thermodynamic limit here? Oh, the thermodynamic limit is that I have a system which is uh, uh, infinitely extended. Okay. Was this a question? Yeah, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we have a system, yeah, which, which has no, no bounds. Good, right, so, so for those who are familiar with matrix product state simulation, this is well known because if we have, um, we know that we can have uniform or infinite matrix product states where we bring them into the canonical form and in, in the MPS, in, in the canonical form of this uh, MPS, it's easy to do measurements with respect to an infinitely extended state. So, so far about the um, formalism, let me now discuss a little bit the properties of the um, symmetry protected uh, topological phase. In fact, this is now the, the we are now looking uh, at, at the transition between the symmetric phase and the symmetric phase, right? So if we just tune a parameter going from the cluster state to the Ising paramagnet, we, we find that there's no symmetry breaking, distinguishing these, these two phases. Right? So we have two phases where for periodic boundary conditions, we have a unique ground state, so, so there's no symmetry breaking that distinguishes these phases, but instead those two phases can be distinguished in terms of non-local um, string order parameters. So in particular, the, 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 the key insight 
that allows us to distinguish these two phases is that they are different in terms of so-called symmetry fractionalization. So if we just take a system with open boundary conditions, then the representation of a symmetry at the edges um, is, is different in those two, two phases. And a direct consequence of this symmetry fractionalization is the existence of a, of a string order parameter. And in particular, what we, what we have to do to distinguish those two phases is that we take, for example, a string of sigma x operator. So we just apply the sigma x operator on consecutive spins, and we take to calculate the expectation value of this as we just make the string longer and longer. And what we find is that in one of the phases, the string order has to be zero. And on the other phase, in the other phase, the string order can be non-zero, right? So, so just to contrast this once more to a symmetry broken phase, if we have a symmetry broken phase, then we can define a local order parameter. For example, we can just look at the correlation between sigma x somewhere and, or like in this model, we could look at a correlation between sigma z somewhere and a sigma z far away. And that gives us access to the magnetization of the state, which is due to a spontaneous breaking of the Z2 symmetry. This we don't have here, so there's no local operator distinguishing these two phases, but we can define a non-local operator here, in this case, consisting of a product of sigma x's, and that distinguishes these, these two phases. And then this is, in fact, the kind of topological nature of, of, this, of these different uh, phases, namely that there is no local order parameter distinguishing um, these guys. Good. So, so what we have is now an example of a topological phase transition. And we know how to realize the phase, or like the, the ground state along, along this uh, topological phase transition. So, so what, what's now um, left is that we just put this together um, in a way that it can be measured on a, on a quantum computer. And then this is done here. So basically what we see here, this is now the, the, the code or the, the, these are now the gates that we need for running this experiment for, and then and, and what we see here is that uh, we, we start, we initiate the, the quantum computer in a simple state where all states are in a zero state. And now we just apply the sequence that I defined earlier, right? So this is now the sequence of gates that creates the ground state of the uh, of this model along the uh, along this parabola. And the parameters, like where we want to be on this parabola, uh, is is defined in terms of parameters that are contained in these these unitaries. And what we do then is that we then have to measure the, the string order. And there are indeed different ways of, of doing it. I mean, one option to, to measure the string order would be to literally do a measurement on many qubits and then sample many shots, which would allow us to give access or get access to the string order. However, <coughs> that for the devices that we used, that turned out to be quite um, um, noisy due to measurement errors. What we found is, is working much better is to use a trick of so-called Ramsey interferometry. And, and the idea is the following. We take our system. So, so this is now the lower n qubits here are now used to represent the state. And now we have one auxiliary qubit. And what we then do is we, after preparing our, our ground state, we then apply a, a Hadamard gate to the first qubit, the upper uppermost qubit here, which brings it into a superposition of up and down, or like it's the superposition of uh, um, zero and one. And then we apply to it a control string order operation. So that means that we have now two copies of our system. Like so we have basically spin zero times the ground state plus 
spin one times the ground state. And this control operation means that in the, in the copy where the spin is, the, the, this auxiliary qubit is in a, in a one state, we apply the string order. And in the other copy, we do not. And then we just apply another Hadama and then we perform a measurement on this single qubit. And now it turns out by just measuring on this single qubit multiple times and determining the real and the imaginary part, we can actually calculate exactly this uh, string order. Right? So just to briefly repeat, there's a useful trick. We just add one ancilla qubit to our system. And then by just performing a controlled operation based on the state of this ancilla qubit, and then measuring this ancilla qubit, we can obtain or we can measure the, uh, the, the quantity that we are interested in. And this has the advantage that we only do a measurement on a, on a single qubit, and it turns out to be less um, noisy. Uh, Frank, sorry, yeah, I have a, a question. couple of questions. The yes, first one sure. is um, so if I understand, if I understood correctly, the first part of your talk. Uh, now, the 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 let's say the circuit that you need is one qubit plus uh, the length of the string, right? Because all the rest, and you are already in the thermodynamic limit. Because all that's the correct. Are, okay, and the other question I don't understand very well. How measuring the ancilla qubit bring because the ancilla qubit is acting only on uh, as a as a as a control, right? So I mm -hmm. I don't see how the ancilla qubit bring the information about the value of uh, SO, let's say, of the string. Uh, can, can you elaborate a bit more on that? How measuring the ancilla qubit I can deduce the other? Uh, uh... Well, this is because of the interference. Because if you just do measurements here, you get phase vectors from the other guy and and in fact it's also a nice <laughs> exercise basically if you just if you just you can just do it by uh, on a piece of paper you can just uh, mm -hmm. take qubits take two qubits and perform a control ah, I see. Mm -hmm. and, ah, I and see. then okay. Okay. then write down the measurement and you see that by just taking the yeah taking note of the real and the imaginary part you can just exactly get the this expectation value. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now I see. Okay. It looks we have another another question by Ismir Gazit. Gazit, uh, please you can unmute yourself hey. and go. Um, just just a general question. I'm less familiar with those uh, machines. So in general, it's more robust to uh, apply a gate and make a measurement because it seems like you know that's sort of a trade off that you try to resolve here, right? Or is it? Uh, Can you hear me? Right. So, yeah, I, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. the 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 short answer is that I in in these machines there's uh, tons of different errors coming together, and from what we then did is we just kind of use different ways of of of, of, of for for measuring the, the the string order, and we found that this one here is working on the machines like on the IBM machines in a much more robust way. Whether this is universal when also applying it on completely different machines, I don't know. My, my suspicion is that, that all this coding that we do has to be quite tailored to a given hardware. Uh, and, and in fact, this is also one thing that I learned from the next project I'm going to talk about in a moment when we discussed with Google. It was really as specific as saying that, well, maybe on one machine, it's 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 easier to, or they have higher fidelity implementations of um, C not gates as compared to uh, control Z gates. It's, it's, it's very specific to, to the machine that we are using. That, does this answer your question? Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for your question. Good, so, so, so basically what we, what I now put together is now a circuit to realize the state in the thermodynamic limit and to measure the string order. And then now we can just get down and do these measurements and the results are now, now shown in, in, in this plot here on the right. So now we have a tuning parameter. The tuning parameter takes us now along the parabola as 
as shown, and then we can do the measurement of the string order parameter. And the string order, depending on how we choose the operator terminating the string order, we can just make it sensitive to be zero in one phase or the other phase. And there we just use knowledge of, of, of the different respective uh, SBT phases. And, and now we can just directly compare to the uh, theoretically expected value, which is the, with the black line here. And most noticeable what we see is that, that the string order nicely signals the, the transition, right? Well, there is a significant error compared to the exact value. Um, we clearly can tell, can tell, can tell apart the, the phases. And, and this tells us that the, the right state is, is, is produced and that the measurement um, worked. I'm quite happy about this because it, we just tried several ideas and it was a successive uh, improvement until we actually got what we see because for, for the very first attempts, we just only saw noise. <laughs> so so it, it really required a little bit of thinking about how to, how to reduce the circuit depth and how to find what kind of measurements to do in order to get a, uh, a good signal. So it, do you understand, I, just, just two curiosities, do you understand why the error is much larger in one phase and in one phase and not in the others? And, and also it looks that is an error that is not related to, let's say, finite string, right? I mean, it looks that L equal to seven is farer than L equal to six. So it looks, uh, okay, yeah, uh, we cannot do a finite size scaling analysis with three points, let's say, but it looks. <laughs> yes. uh, Here again, I'm, I'm not, but I mean, the, the, the error that we get is, um, I mean, the fact that it looks, worse in one phase as compared to the other depends also for certain rotations they, they, those are easier to make than than others so, so so that is i think pretty well understood um getting a proper finite size scaling I, I i have i have no idea and not for this and also even like when we worked for the other directly with the google team we were not feeling very confident to this isolate what the errors are um, um, to, to see what is actually due to coupling to the to a path, what is due to um, noise in, 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 in the gates. I mean, that was apparently really hard to, to disentangle also for, for experts. <laughs> so. Okay, thanks. So, so what we then considered here is really the, uh, the kind of simplest cases. So, so we just have a, transition from a cluster state to a, to a paramagnetic state. But in the, in the meantime, also, we just wrote a theory paper where we can generalize the same framework to the entire one-dimensional BDI class. And so, so, so basically, we can exactly write down the, the code, which is increasingly getting harder to monitor or to, to model phase transitions between all integer uh, um, BDI phases. So, so the way that we can think about it is that we have now this high dimensional phase diagram involving the integer number of different phases. And there is a skeleton within this big phase diagram. And as long as we stay in the bones of, these, uh, of the skeleton, then we can exactly represent the, the, the states um, using similar circuits, except that the difficulty of representing these circuits will, will increase as we go to more complex or more difficult phases. Good, so, so this concludes this part where we just discussed how to use now a, a digital quantum computer to realize uh, different SPT phases. And let me now briefly just comment on a, on a competing hardware, and these are so-called analog um, quantum simulations, and um, I just want to be really brief on this. So, so the idea for analog quantum computers or analog quantum simulators is now a bit different. So, in 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 these machines, well, we we wouldn't have a, a gate set to <clears throat> we wouldn't have a universal gate set, but in fact, 
we would have a physical system which has a very high level of, of control. And in, in this case, this is a work done jointly with uh, Emmanuel Bloch in his group where they have, um, they, they can simulate a, um, a Fermi, Fermi gas um, on, a, on, a, on a lettuce. So in particular, they can now simulate a Fermi Hubbard letter uh, um, where we just, like if you, if you look at this grid here, we literally like the, 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 the green dots here are now a, a fermion trapped on, on those sides. And what can then be tuned is, is really the ratio of u over t, like u being the on-site interaction, t being the hopping. And it can be just driven into the mod insulating phase where the system is then perturbatively described by, uh, by a, a Heisenberg model. Now, <laughs> and, and, and now this nicely shows how, how life is a bit different when using these setups. So, so the, the systems can be really neatly described, but there are certain limitations. So for example, what they can do in, in their setup is they can tune the ratio of the vertical hopping, um, so J, J perp and J longitudinal in this direction, and they can just choose the geometry basically. And, and with this, we have to, to basically come up with ideas how to um, see interesting physics and and a way how the system can then realize different phases is actually by just choosing different different unit cells. So, so we can choose the unit cell in the way it's shown here on the left. If we have the system on the left, now we have strong coupling within the unit cell and weak coupling uh, between the unit cells. And in this case, we would say that this is a trivial phase because the spins form now singlets within the unit cell. And the other type of unit cell that we can choose is the tilted unit cell as, as shown here. And in this case, if we have now the strong coupling um, on the vertical bonds, we see that now we have singlets between unit cells. And that exactly corresponds to an example of the Haldane chain. And in the same way as we did it before, we can now define a string order parameter. Uh, the string order is now acting on, like, and these are now spin rotations on side of the unit cell. This kind of distinguishes now the, the two phases. And again, now instead of doing measurements on a quantum computer, using microscopic uh, imaging, uh, they can now directly do a measurement on the on the strings and distinguish the two phases in terms of the symmetry breaking. So in particular, we have a trivial string order and we have a non-trivial string order. And we see that in the trivial phase, the trivial string order is larger compared to the uh, non-trivial string order. And if we just choose the other unit cell, this is reversed as we would expect um, theoretically. And also in this case, we have to deal with significant imperfections. In particular, we can't really reach zero temperature. So there are still fluctuations, which, which tells us that we won't measure the exact value that we get theoretically. But we just do see that the right, that, the, that, that we just have <laughs> the, the correct correlations basically to tell apart those two, two phases. Good. So this basically concludes uh, the first part where I, on one hand, showed how we can simulate a path going from one symmetry protected topological phase to, to another. And then we can measure string order parameters directly on a, on a quantum computer. And I briefly sketched results from an um, analog um, quantum simulator allowing uh, us to, to measure string order and to distinguish the um, two different phases. Let me now change gears, but if there are questions about the first part, maybe this is a good time to, to pause. 
perhaps um, a, a trivial question, um, a bit unrelated to the talk, but what's uh, the magic of that particular parabola that you showed? I mean, I understand that the magic is that the circuit is particularly simple, but why? Mm. Along the circuit, there's a nice algebraic structure that we can use. It's, it's, it's the same as along this path, we can we can just always find the matrix product state solution of the of the of the Hamiltonian, and then we can transform this matrix product state into a sequential circuit. I see. Okay. Thanks. Are there further questions? Looks no. So I think yeah, you can go ahead. Good, good, right. So, so let me now shift to the second part where we now use a quantum computer to realize the ground state of a topologically ordered system, and we can then look at different characteristic properties of of this phase. So, in a similar spirit as to what we did before, I want to start off by introducing a simple lattice model that realizes the physics that we are interested in. And the model that we are interested in now is the uh, Tory code model. And the Tory code model is a two-dimensional lattice model. And the lattice is, is shown here, right? So, so we have now the um, Ising spins sitting on the bonds of our square lattice, right? So wherever we have a dot, we have an Ising spin. And the Hamiltonian contains two terms. One term is the um, vertex term. Like, so we have now a sum over all these vertices. And we have on in this Hamiltonian, we have now the product of all four Ising Z spins. Right? So, so here we have the uh, Ising Z or like the, the poly Z operators. And we just take a product of four of them on, on each plaquette. And then uh, on each vertex and on each plaquette, we have now the product of all uh, four sigma x operators. And this model is exactly solvable. In particular, it doesn't take a lot of work to figure out that all the terms in the Hamiltonian mutually commute. And the ground state has a very nice nature and it's uh, very easy to, to represent. In particular, if we just represent the spins in the Z basis and we say that, well, whenever the spin is say in a plus one, in a Z, Z, um, sigma Z equal to plus one eigenstate, in that case, we just don't do anything. And if we, if a spin is in a sigma Z minus one eigenstate, we just draw a thick red line onto that given bond. Then we see that the first term here uh, enforces in order to kind of uh, minimize this term. What we get is we 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 find that every loop covering of this lattice is a is a ground state of this one. And the second term, in order to minimize this guy, we find that the ground state is then given by an equal weighted superposition of all possible loop coverings. Makes it. So we have now a lattice model defined in a certain way. And the ground state is now an equal weighted superposition of all uh, loop coverings. And this state has a Z2 topological order. Um, I'll come back in a moment to what the implications of this are. So the first task that we are then faced with is like, how do we realize or how do we code this state on a, on a quantum computer? And similar as we did for the case before, we can now come up with a gate sequence, like with a fairly shallow circuit that is doing the job. And then this is demonstrated here. And I want to just walk you through this, this diagram and also explain to you what these um, color plots mean, because we're going to use them a lot um, in the next couple of slides. So, so the key is maybe to start from the top most um, figure here. So here we the, the black lattice is exactly the lattice that I've um, shown a, a moment ago, 
where we have the qubits or the spins to live on the on the bonds, uh, and 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 this is demonstrated here. Right, I'm we just now changing from the representation that I did a moment ago to actually representing the qubits as they are actually also arranged on the on the Google device on the Google Sycamore device. Good. So we have again on every bond we have a qubit, and now the way that we just represent the state is now in the following you see that below the vertices we have now a blue tile and the fact that this is a blue tile means that the z parity on that vertex is plus one and this is also quite obvious because now we have our starting state is a state where we have spin zero uh, spin sz equals to zero or sigma z equals to, to plus one on, on all qubits in the entire system. And that means that clearly we have a parity plus one on each of these vertices indicated by this blue tile. And on the plaquettes corresponding to this gray tile, we measure zero because all of them are in a, a sigma z equals to zero um, parity. Uh, or the expectation value of the parity is, is zero. Good. Right. So, so we see that the blue tiles or the vertices are all in a proper ground state, but the plaquettes or these gray tiles are, are not. So, so now we have a, a sequence, and the sequence works in the following way. We just first apply Hadamard gates to a subset of the qubits, bringing them into a uh, zero plus one state and now what we do is sequentially from the center to the outside from the center column to the outside we now sequentially apply c naught gates as, as shown here and once we are done with the sequence we are ending up in in this state and this is now exactly the state we are interested in because we now have uh, z parity is plus one on the vertices and the x parity is plus one on all plaquettes. So, so using these tiles, the ground state of the Tory code state is a, is a state where the plaquettes are either blue or, or purple. And, and that's now exactly the, the ground state that we are interested in. So now we can just run this code on the actual device and this is now run on the sycamore chip we just get the picture as shown here where we can on this device now measure the parity or the z and x parity on the vertices and and plaquettes respectively and we see that we are in a pretty high fidelity in in a proper ground state so this is the first victory we can claim that using the sequence that we found a uh, sequence which grows linearly in uh, in system size uh, linear in the linear system size it uh, produces the the ground state and now that we have the ground state we can play around with it and um, measure properties that allow us to characterize the ground state and the first characteristic property i want to point out of of these topologically ordered phases is the topological entanglement entropy. In particular, if we just cut out a, a, a block, like a, a circle, say, out of our two-dimensional state, what we would find is that there's a leading contribution, which is the area law, so that the entanglement entropy, like basically the amount of entanglement between the degrees of freedom inside of the circle with the outside has a, is, is proportional to the cut. But then we have a constant subleading contribution, which is the so-called topological entanglement entropy. And by using a useful subtraction scheme as introduced by Kitaev and Preskill and also Levin and Wen, we can isolate this constant bit by just smartly choosing the different partitions and subtracting and adding them. And that removes all the local parts and only leaves behind this, this a topological part of the entanglement entropy. So, so the ground state of these Tory code state is a 
topologically ordered state and the topologically ordered state has this non-local contribution to its entanglement. So now this can be measured on, on the device. So using different techniques, either full state tomography for small partitions and randomized measurements for large partitions, we can then extract or we can measure the entanglement entropy. And, and first, I mean, there's a lot of data to take in, but the main message is that by measuring the entanglement entropy, we do see the area law. So there, there are <clears throat> the ground state has a proper area law. And if we just add and subtract the partitions as, as proposed by um, Kitaev and Preskill and Levin and Wen, we can then extract the topological entanglement entropy. And, and this is now plotted here in the histogram measured for different partitions on different locations on the chip. We see that all the measurements are pretty close to the expected value of, of log two, right? So, so what it tells us that we just have created a state that actually contains the non-local entanglement entropy as anticipated for this topologically ordered state. This is one part of the characterization, but there is something else uh, which is noticeable about these topologically ordered states. And, and this is the existence of so-called anionic excitations, which means that on top of the ground state, we can now create point-like excitations. And these point-like excitations do not necessarily behave as uh, bosons or fermions. They can have a rather exotic anionic statistics. And moreover, even starting from a simple spin system where we have no fermions, we can have emergent fermionic excitations. And in order to probe these, what we want to do is we would like on the one hand to measure the exchange statistics. So what happens if we take two identical quasi-particles and we exchange them, and also the mutual information, which just means we take one anion of type uh, A uh, and move it around another anion of type B, and we just measure the resulting phase factor. So this is something that we can now directly access on the, on the quantum computer. And let me just show some um, movie. In particular, this is now what we do. So the, the background is now showing exactly the ground state. Right? Just recall the ground state consists of plaquettes, which are uh, blue and purple, right? corresponding to the Z parity of plus one and X parity of plus one. And if we now apply a string of sigma z's or sigma x's respectively, at the endpoints of those strings, we create now a anion. So we just now create a point-like excitation. So we can now have a defect of the vertex term. This would be an electric charge. And we could have a, a string ending on a, on a plaquette, an, a z string ending on a, on a plaquette. And this gives rise to a magnetic charge. And now I just point out like what we are looking at is actually measured data on the, on the quantum computer, because now what we can do is we can just apply a sequence on, on the state and now move charges around each other. And what we see is that there is a little bit of noise. You see that the background color and everything is changing a little bit as we apply it, but we just do also see that the, that there, that there is really a well-defined quasi-particle which we can now move around. So, so the device now allows to just literally um, do braiding, so we can now just move particles around each other. Here, I just showing this in terms of snapshot data, where we just apply part of the sequence and then do the measurement. And that, however, doesn't really allow us to keep track of the the phase degree of freedom. And in order to do this, we just now utilize a trick very similar to what we did for measuring the string order. In particular, we are doing the, um, this interferometric approach. So what we do is we just now create a state where we have now a pair of, of these anions and now add an ancilla or an extra qubit to, to our system. And what we are then doing is we just apply a Hadamard as we did before. And now we have a superposition of up times the state with the excitations and down with the excitations. And then we just apply a control U operation. And the control U operation is now 
doing an exchange of the particles in one copy and not doing an exchange in the other copy. And from doing a measurement on this ancilla qubit, we can again, we can then read off the, the phase factor that we get for applying this U operation. It's exactly the same trick as what we did in the string order measurement. And <clears throat> let me here now just summarize the, the results. Uh, and we can now, we just now know exactly what kind of U operator is corresponding to exchanging what, exchanging or moving around what kind of anions. And, and, and now, for example, we could see that if we exchange uh, and Sorry, uh, looks we have a we have another question from Sneer. So, sure. Hey, um, so I have a question about this trick. So, um, it it seemed like it would work only for a, a, a billion order, right? Um, because you only need to pick up a phase, right? So there's a generalization for a, let's say for non-abelian topological order. <laughs> yes. Yes. It... Uh... Um, in fact, I just, on the next slide, I'm showing a reference. Where oh, we okay. work oh, right. the... Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. So, thanks for the question. So, so let me just highlight a few few of the results. So, if we take, for example, two m particles and we exchange them, then we just measure a phase of of zero. Uh, and if we now take a, a molecule or a bound state of, a, of an E and an M particle, we exchange them, we measure a phase which is near pi, which is the expected value for a, for a fermion. So, so we see that using these measurements, we actually see an uh, emergent fermion in, in our, our model. So now um, two comments. So, so one comment is we can now on this device change uh, the boundary. And if we just go to periodic boundary conditions, we can use these, this framework to actually encode logical qubits. And what we showed is that the qubits can actually be more robust than having an individual qubit, in, in, like a physical qubit. So this is sort of towards some, um, some active type of uh, error correction. And, <laughs> and the second part, and this is actually uh, partly related to the question that Snir just asked, is that um, everything that I've shown using deeper circuits can be directly generated to all string dead models, which means that we can also use this to for, 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 do, for, for measuring non-abelian um, braiding. And the, the downside is that the circuits get significantly harder so going from a Tory code to the simplest non-abelian string net, which would be a Fibonacci anions, is about a factor of 10 in circuit depth. And so, so this is still not reachable for, for current devices, but that might be interesting for, for future um, devices. Good, uh, that brings me to the end. So in the first part, I discussed how to realize a phase transition between a topological and a symmetry protected, uh, between a um, symmetry protected topological and a trivial phase. In the second part, I, I showed how to realize the topologically ordered state and how to measure topological entanglement entropy and the anionic braiding statistics. So that brings me to the end. And let me thank my uh, collaborators, uh, the team at. Um, uh, at, at Munich, and uh, also uh, Andrew Green, Christina Knapp, Kevin Satzinger, and Petra Rushan. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions? Okay, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have a question on the second part. So uh, is it possible to sort of engineer non-abelian I, I'm sorry, is it possible to engineer a, like dislocation defect or something like that to sort of trap the non abelian anion in, in, in your setting? Uh, this is a good question. I haven't thought about it, but it should be possible. I mean, we could just, well, 
I, I, yes, it is possible. Question is uh, how cheap it would be because mm. the the lattice geometry is directly tailored to have a defect-free toric code model, for example. Mm. Or a, a, and if we want to have defect, that would necessarily involve some non-local gates, which would make it harder. But mm. but then this is also something where it might be interesting to then talk to experimentalists because in principle, they might also be able to have different rearrangement of their qubits on a device. So such that one could have, have a hardware which is designed for trapping any ones. Thanks. Other questions? Maybe also from the chat from the online participants. Okay, so let me ask just. Uh, uh, I have a question on the first part. So mm -hmm. I would have thought that SP, to prepare a SPT phase on a phone circuit, it only requires a constant depth. So you somehow encode NTS to construct SPT phase on the phone circuit that requires a linear depth. Is it true? Uh, is there a way to sort of reduce the number of depths in, in your construction? Right. So the fixed points can be. So I can realize the cluster state and also the paramagnet um, using a constant depth. If I want to follow this, this line, I mean, uh -huh. if I just, if I want to track the um, phase transition, um, this is in fact not possible, because oh, I if I, I mean, if I want to, if I, if I'm looking at the ground state at at this very point, which is in fact in terms of the non-interacting theory a quadratic touching point, at that point the 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 ground state is a cat state. So we have, so 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 the neat thing or the is that if you, for example look at the correlation length as uh, as function of g you actually see that the correlation length at this very point is, is in fact infinite and this infinite correlation length you can only get by uh, a linear depth uh, at, uh, which would be the kind of simplest one you can have okay, thanks we have also a question from hung shi kim uh, please uh, yeah, so thank you very much for your very nice talk. So actually, I'm, I'm a, a layman in this field, so let me ask a, a stupid question. So uh, to me, it seems that uh, the, the you have to have uh, some clear representation of the ground state to simulate that uh, with your quantum processors. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering whether you have some experience of trying to simulate the general Hamiltonian and then get the eigenstates from the quantum processors. Okay, thanks. You're right. This is yeah, this is actually a very good question. So, so the what, what we ultimately would like to do is indeed exactly what you said that well we have some Hamiltonian and then we want to find the ground state um, using, for example, uh, variational ansatz, right? So, so, so what we might want to do is we might say that well we just choose we just uh, let me step back. So what we ideally would like to do is we want to say that, well, we just take a Hamiltonian and now we just find the exact ground state of that Hamiltonian. That would be extremely hard because if I take, for example, the Kagome Heisenberg model and I would like to represent the ground state exactly on my quantum computer, that would involve then a number of gates which would grow exponentially with system size, right? So, so just preparing the state exactly on a quantum computer would again be exponentially hard. So, so then we wouldn't really gain necessarily too much. Then what we can do as the next step is we could say that, well, what we can do is we can say that we can now write down a variational ansatz, similar as we do, for example, when we just use classical computers and matrix product state or tensor product states. 
And what we would like to do then is we would like to have an ansatz for the wave function, which might be beyond what can be represented on a classical computer. So we could now represent states that have a fairly amount, large amount of entanglement, but yet they can be represented using fairly shallow circuits. And this is one direction that we actually followed, where we just say that, well, motivated by these kind of sequential ansatz, what we do is we now have a generic ansatz where we just repeatedly sequentially apply gates. And that is now a variational state which is good to represent a certain class of, of states. So now these states require then a variational optimization. Right? So, so that we just say that for this Hamiltonian, we just minimize the energy within this variational manifold. And this is where now the problem lies because doing this variational optimization requires to measure gradients with a very high accuracy, which is not possible on, on current devices. <laughs> So, so, but taking away this problem, then what we could do is we could, for example, say that, well, let us now take a model where we don't know the answer. We could now do a variational optimization. And instead of having the exact circuit, we replace it by a variationally optimized circuit. And then we can use exactly the same trick for measuring the string order. But this is not possible using current devices. I see, yeah. Thank you very much for very detailed answers for some mm -hmm. very naive question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you have no more questions, maybe we can thank Frank again for uh, for the talk. Okay. Next talk is going to be in 15 minutes, right? For 4.15. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>